So, hey, I want to start today's message with a question as we continue this from Failure to Freedom series. And here's the question. What do you do when the road ahead looks impossible to you, but you can't go back to where you came from either? Anybody ever been at a place like that? Maybe you feel like that right now. Maybe you go, you know, the place I've come from, I can't go back there because that was not a good place. But now, even as I look ahead, something's come up, a situation, circumstances have arisen in such a way that I go, I, it looks impossible to move forward and I can't go back. And what happens in a situation like that is you feel stuck. And so there are people in the house today or watching online today that feel stuck. You feel like you're in an impossible situation where Failure is kind of on either side of you, and there's no way out of this one. So what do you do? That's the question, and that's why I've highlighted that part, when you feel stuck. Here's what you need to know. Moses and the Israelites found themselves in that exact situation. And so they can speak to us today as we look back at some of the Old Testament. What we've been doing in our church since nearly the beginning of the year is we've been going through the Bible. And so we started with Genesis, now we're in the book of Exodus, and we're going to keep marching on through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. And uh, we're really discovering the whole story of who God is and how that connects with our lives. So if you have been reading Exodus, you're going to have read probably what I'm going to talk about today. If you're not reading it, I'll share with you. I'll give you plenty of context, but I also want to invite you into that. And if you're new here at our church, you're like, whoa, y'all are reading the Bible. Yep, we're doing that. So we would love to invite you to get in on that. I've always been saying that you'll get more out of Sundays if you invest on Monday, Tuesday, all through the week as well. Just reading a bit of scripture, it will help you. So Moses and the Israelites end up in a place where the road ahead looks impossible and where they know they can't go back to where they came from. Let me give you a little context to get us where we are now today. And the Israelites were told by God a long time before they were in Egypt, which is where uh, they are leaving today, Uh, We're going to be looking at them leaving Egypt and slavery for 400 years or so, being in chains. We've been talking about that. They're going to be heading to the promised land. That promised land was given to them in a promise, not yet given to them by God, all the way back with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And so God calls this guy named Abraham to leave his home country and to travel to a country that he's never been to. God says, I'm going to give you a promised land. Yet, the Israelites, centuries later, really, are not there yet. The Israelites end up as slaves in Egypt. We talked about how they ended up there. It was a good thing at first, but then it turned into a bad thing, and they ended up in chains, and we've been using the imagery of chains and slavery, and the people were stuck there and couldn't get out. Generations were actually enslaved. 400-something years, most commentators believe they were there. That's your children's 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 children. Do you understand this? I mean, children are being born into this captivity. Why were they captives? Well, Egypt was using them to build their cities, free labor, basically. And so God raises up a man named Moses, we've looked at that, to be the deliverer of God's people and to lead them out of Egypt because God said, I'm giving you a promised land, and they weren't there yet. And so God raises up a deliverer, and through a series of what are known as plagues, you've probably heard about that even if you haven't read it, the 10 plagues, crazy stuff, y'all, and it could happen now. It wasn't raining at the first service, but you go outside, I want you to imagine after this, and frogs are everywhere. That's one of the plagues. Did you all read about that? It's crazy. The plagues that happen are unbelievable, but so much so that it's not just a couple frogs or whatever, one of the plagues, it's gazillions of them, and it ends up killing people and killing crops and all this. That's one of them, locusts. There's all this stuff that happens, the last one being the death of the firstborn Egyptian children, a horrible thing. But these are the plagues that are brought upon them because they won't let God's people go when Moses says, let my people go. Eventually, the Pharaoh relents and says, you guys can go. I've had enough, basically. And so all of the Israelites, many of them, many commentators believe there was a million or more of them, but at least thousands of them at this point, they end up marching out of Egypt and into the wilderness, and they head out, and God, listen to this, takes them to the edge of a sea called the Red Sea. 
It's a big body of water. So they're camped out here and for the night. And then we're going to pick up the story there, all right? So God leads them to the Red Sea. Some of you know the story. I bet a lot of you do. Don't get ahead of me because you won't get as much out of it. And here's the thing. You might know the story, but your story, you might be struggling in your own story and not believing truly in the God that's going to deliver the people. So how does he do it? That's what we want to dig into today. So I want to pick it up there. Here's what it says in Exodus 14. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, he let them go and they fled. Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. Uh Uh-oh, why'd we let them go? What have we done letting all the Israelite slaves get away? Free labor, right? Building our cities. So Pharaoh harnessed, check this out, his chariot and called his troops. He took with him 600 of Egypt's best chariots. These are like tanks today. I mean, this is their warfare uh, equipment. So he takes the chariots, each with its commander. So, I mean, like tons of soldiers here. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh the king of Egypt. So he chased after the people of Israel who had left with fists raised in defiance. You've had us in slavery for 400 years. Finally, God has raised up a deliverer in Moses. We're leaving. And so they walk out of Egypt. They head out into the wilderness and God directs them to this place and they're camped out right in front of the Red Sea. It goes on. The Egyptians chased after them. Imagine this, with all the forces in Pharaoh's army, all his horses and chariots, his charioteers and his troops. This, y'all, is thousands of people. The Egyptians caught up with the people of Israel. Now, I want you to imagine, if you've seen Jurassic Park when the T-Rex is coming, I mean, this is that kind of moment. The Israelites are camped out They think that God has led them and he has to this place and they're free now. And all of a sudden the ground starts shaking because thousands of troops, including 600 chariots, are headed their way. Dust storm coming. The ground is moving. This is what is happening. And then it says this, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked. And I want to hang on that word. They panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. All right, so do you all understand this this scene? They've just been freed from Egypt. It hasn't been long. They've gone out into the wilderness, leaving Egypt. They're headed for the promised land. God directs them and guides them to this place where they're camped out with the Red Sea in front of them. But now the Pharaoh has changed his mind about the Israelites leaving. He's having second thoughts about it. So he goes to take them, to kill them. He's upset about it or to re-enslave them. He catches up to them at the Red Sea. So the scene very simply, visually is this. If I'm the Israelites, here I am. In front of me, the Red Sea. Impossible to move forward, right? Behind me, the chariots and the armies of Pharaoh, impossible to go that way or will be killed. So the Israelites do what we all would do. Give me a break. You wouldn't panic, right? They panic. They freak out over this situation. It's the kind of panic that starts inside. Y'all ever had this? And then it grows and grows to the point that visually people can see it. Some of us are good at what we call church face here, which we don't like, but probably I'm the best at it, to be honest. I can be freaking out on the inside and act okay on the outside, but there comes a point where if I panic enough or the situation's desperate enough for me, you will notice. Uh, Anybody ever had that happen to them? Sometimes it happens in like simple, like somebody calls on you in class and your face turns red. That ever happened to you? And you're like, you start panicking and it gets more red. Yeah. Yeah. It happens to me a lot, actually, if I get called on. It's fun. Not that I sit in class. I do sometimes or whatever, but at a conference and somebody point, you weren't ready for it. And you you would think a guy that stands on a stage wouldn't, his face wouldn't turn red, but mine does. And then it gets more red as I think about it, you know, and splotchy and stuff like this. This is what happens. This is panic. You start to see it. This is what's going on with the Israelites. The word panic here can mean fear with a sense of dread. So what this means is they're not just afraid, they're, and 
Fear with a sense of dread is a horrible thing. It makes you feel like there's no way out. This is why I say we're stuck. You know, we feel stuck. Fear with a sense of dread. This is a very bad situation for them. So it's getting chaotic, right? Moses is in charge. He's the leader. He's beginning to watch the ripple effects go out into thousands, maybe even a million people. And y'all, he couldn't just send a text to them about what to do. I mean, when you got that many people, it is hard to, to be in charge and you have to rely on other people. So maybe his leaders start freaking out and then the people start freaking out. Everybody's panicking, right? And so Moses has to figure out what to do. So here's what happens. Watch what Moses does. It says this, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Oh, thank you, Moses. I was freaking out, man. I was panicking, but I'm okay now since you said that. And then look at what he says. This is one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. Kind of a strange verse to like, but man, I rely on this sometimes in my life. It says this, just stand still, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. Some translations of the Bible say this, see the salvation of the Lord this day. Like, what are you talking about, Moses? There's a sea in front of us and there's an Egyptian army about ready to kill us behind us. And Moses is like, look, what I need you to do is not panic. You're panicking and I need you to not panic. We need to calm down. The Egyptians you see today, Moses goes on, will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Last week or week before, I said God is on our side. And here it says that the Lord's going to fight for you. Just, and he says it again, stay calm right? Don't be afraid. Stand still. Stay calm. So on one hand, you have the Israelites, and if we can kind of visually think about it, panic. And on the other hand, you've got this one man, Moses, the leader. Be calm. How how y'all do with that, by the way, just in life? When, When you know that the right answer would be, be calm. Don't freak out. When you're in an impossible situation, are you in this story? Can you imagine? Now, I know you know, I know what God's going to do. They didn't. You know what God's going to do in the situation you're in? Very often you don't. And you're panicking. And the opposite of that is Moses over here saying, hey, we need to, we need to trust. We need to trust. These are the instructions from Moses, and I think it's the same for us. I think when the situation happens to us, when the circumstance happens, you you have this choice. I'm I'm either going to panic or I'm going to trust. And I was talking to some people between services, and we were talking about how it's not as clear-cut as that. And very often, it's not. You hear a sermon, and you're like, well, I'm I'm a terrible person. Like, I'm I'm, I'm not trusting. I'm panicking. It's it's a bad, and I was saying to somebody, man, I can go from trust to panic in a half second. Like half second. Look at Peter in the New Testament when he was walking on water and he's doing good and then he panics and he sinks and then God, Jesus reaches down in the water and pulls him back up out of the water and he's back on the water again. I mean, that's kind of how life can be. And so I know it's not as clear cut and easy, but you know, we have the choice to either, and you go, it's not a choice. I mean, the situation dictates it. Well, let's look at this because The people, Israel, they're panicking, and Moses is saying that they need to trust. Why would he say that if it weren't possible? Moses, and y'all, Moses, I know you know the story probably, or you've read ahead, but Moses didn't have the rest of the story written. He was living in the moment. He did not know what God was going to do. He had no idea at this point what God was going to do. But he was telling the people, can you imagine the faith of Moses in that? Hasn't he grown? He went from this guy that argued with God just a couple chapters earlier about, I can't do what you want me to do. I got no, I don't know how to, how do I even tell the Pharaoh to let the people go? He's going to kill me. And now the Pharaoh's right there with an army and he's got an ocean in front of him basically. And he's like, we need to trust. Y'all need to stay calm and watch what God's about to do. He's going to rescue us today. He'll fight for us not knowing what that looks like. Just amazing what's happened to Moses. So we either panic 
or we trust. Now, let's finish the story. I'm going to say some things about it. It says this, then the Lord said to Moses, I like this, although it bothered me at first. I mean, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. I was like, God, come on, man. That's a good sermon he's preaching. Hey, y'all, don't panic. (laughs) Calm down. Trust. Watch God rescue you. He's, I would have thought God was like, yes, finally, Moses, you're getting it. But no, what does he say? Why are you crying out to me? (laughs) We got a problem here. I need you to get moving. (laughs) God sees what's happening, and he's like, we've got an army behind us. I need you to get moving. I did not understand this. So I looked up the word in Hebrew for get moving is what our English translation says, or at least the one I was reading, the New Living Translation. I was like, what does that mean? And so there's a, there's a range of meaning, but it basically means, the bottom line, it means this. Watch this. Step forward. I was like, well, wait a minute. So it's not back. You can't go this way. They know that. Step forward. Well, what's in front of them, y'all? The sea. Some commentators talk about it could have been that he was saying, get your feet wet. Start, start walking. And they're walking into the water forward going, what are we doing? This is insanity, right? Because the road forward looks what? Impossible. Complete failure. What are you talking about? Move forward. Tell the people to get moving. The moving is not going around the sea. The moving is not go backwards. It's move forward. Because see, there's no going back to slavery in Egypt. Although, you know what the people are saying at this point? If you've read, I'm reading selected parts of this. They're like, Moses, you idiot. They were fine leaving Egypt in defiance. And now a few days later, they're like, you idiot. You let us out here into the wilderness. And now we're at the, we can't go forward. What are you talking about move forward? We can't. And now we're going to get killed. It would have been better, some of them say, for us to just stay in slaves in Egypt because at least we were alive and at least we had some nasty food to eat. We got no food out here. I'm hungry. When people get hungry, they get hangry. Amen? They hangry, friends. They're upset. They're getting upset at Moses. Moses is saying crazy stuff. Like, Calm down. Be at peace. Wow. This is crazy. Move forward. And they have to move forward. All right, I want to give you the rest of it. He still didn't know what was going to happen at this point. But here's the rest of the story. It says this. God goes on with his instructions. Pick up your staff. Raise your hand over the sea. Now he's telling them what to do. Divide the water. Huh? (laughs) Divide the water so the Israelites can walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. Now watch this next part about God fighting for them. It's powerful. It says this. Then the angel of God, I want to pause here for a moment and say, do somebody go home and you want to dig in a little deeper, a little homework, check out the angel of God. That's all I'm going to tell you. Study that and understand what the angel of God, who the angel of God is, who had been leading the people of Israel, move to the rear of the camp. Y'all, this should give you goosebumps. Here is the angel of God in front of them. And now the angel of God moves around the back. Why? because he's got to protect their backside here. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. So now Egypt sees this cloud by day, and it says, as darkness fell, the cloud turned into fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. The Egyptians were like, we can't mess with that. What's going on here? It says this, then Moses raised his hand over the sea, And the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. A miracle. And this is what God did to move them forward. So the Israelites cross the sea on dry land. They get to the other side. And after they get across, the Pharaoh says, let's 
Go get them. So they go down into the Red Sea on the dry land as well. And as the Israelites move out, the Egyptians move in. God releases the waters. It crashes upon them and takes them out. And God, listen to this. I'm going to say this very intentionally. Rescues his panicking people. Not just rescues his people. And that might be a word for somebody today. God rescues his panicking people. Doesn't say they ever calm down. <laughs> Just says that it opens up and they see a way forward and they begin to go that way. All of this, y'all, teaches me some things about God that I want to share with you today as we close this. And how, listen to this, a situation can look one way to me, but it can look another way to God. What you see is not always what God sees. What I see is impossible. A sea in front of me. Failure. Like, I can't go that way. And some of you are in a place right now where it feels like that in a relationship. Or it feels like that with an addiction or something you're struggling with. Or your own mind is where you get lost and hurt and struggle and you go, I can never think straight. I can never, I can never have a healthy mind and way of thinking. And you're like, I, I don't even see a way forward. I can't go back to where I came from because that's even worse. And here I am trying to move forward, but I can't move forward. And God led me to this place and now I'm stuck here. Thanks a lot, God. And sometimes we just want to shake our fists at him. We were talking about this this week. I was, sometimes I bump some of this stuff off staff. Sometimes that's not a good idea because somebody was like, no, it's always a good idea. Somebody was like, do you know it says God led them there? And I was like, no. <laughs> I'm like almost done. Don't mess me up. And I looked at it, and I said, yes, it does. God himself led them to where they were, where they were camped in that impossible situation. And, and y'all, it looked crazy to them. And I'm here to tell you that if you don't realize Christianity is a little crazy, it, it's a little crazy. Amen? I mean, by that, here's what I mean by that. Like, there ought to be some things that, that people look at you and go, that's crazy, why are you moving forward? That looks impossible. And you're like, I trust God. Well, you're crazy. Yep, that's a little bit the way it works. If your Christianity is comfortable all the time, then it's not Christianity. I would dare say it's religion. And you've gotten comfortable there. Because what God does is he takes us to places sometimes and it looks like we're stuck in an impossible situation and failure all around us. And he says, keep moving. And we, we look crazy stepping out because what is this? This is faith. Amen? Y'all, this is faith. This is trust. Panic over here. Trust over here. What are we going to do? It looks impossible. It looks like failure. But God always sees a way forward. And so as I thought about that this week, it led me to this point that I want to share with you. And this is going to sound so simple. Some of you are probably going to take a picture of it or write it down or tweet it or something like that, and that's all fine. But it's, it's so important to let this sink in because it sounds so simple. In fact, there are times when I write things down and it sounds so simple, I'm like, that's not profound enough. But sometimes the most profound thing is the simplest thing. John, what is it? What is it? Here it is. God makes a way. Even when it looks like there is no way, has anybody ever experienced that in their life where you say, there was no way that I was going to get out of this? I was stuck. The only way I could move forward is God. And even when you panicked, he was still faithful. Amen? God makes a way forward even when it seems there's no way. Now, I know this doesn't seem right. This is counterintuitive. <laughs> this is where we look a little off sometimes as Christians. But again, that's where people look at us and say, how? That's where they see faith, that you can enter a situation and move into something. And I don't mean like everything's going to be perfect. They were rescued. You know generations. Every one of them would die in the desert. That's coming next week. 
they're not going to still make it to the promised land, but God's going to get them there a generation later, which tells us sometimes what we're doing today is important, but it's what we're doing today that leads to the future that's even more important. But they're going to die in the wilderness. So I'm not saying it works out perfectly for them. They didn't get across the Red Sea and bam, they're in the promised land because they kept doubting and doubting and panicking and panicking and getting ticked off. It's amazing they didn't kill Moses when you read about it. I mean, they wanted to. I mean, Moses goes up and gets the Ten Commandments after this, and when he comes back down, they're dancing around a golden calf, like, whoa! And Moses is like, what is that? And they're like, it's our new God. It's a golden cow. Like, I've been gone just a few days, man. <laughs> Remember God who took us through the Red Sea? Yeah, well, we're, well nothing's working. Isn't this how we are as people? So it, it's not that it goes perfect for them. It's not, and that's not even what we're saying here, but God always makes a way when it looks like there's no way. Y'all, so I'm getting a little older, and some of you are like, you're so young. Well, yeah, but, you know, if somebody sitting in the room is 20, I'm old, all right? As I, I, I'm entering a new thing, and I was journaling the other day, and I was thinking about where am I lacking in faith and trust. You know what I wrote down? It surprised even me. Have you ever, it, it, like myself, like I'm the only one there, me and God, and I just felt like God was asking me to just kind of, hey, where are you lacking trust and faith? Do you know one of the things I wrote down? Aging. It's like I never wrote that before. But since about 45-ish, I'm like, this is starting to be different. And I'll be real honest, I've watched people my age die. People much younger than me as well, but people my age. And so you enter a new, I, was, I felt immortal earlier. But being a pastor and seeing things and tragedy that happens in people's lives and just my own self aging and realizing that tomorrow I could get a diagnosis, and some of you have a diagnosis right now, that, that you don't know what's going to happen. I began to realize that God has to make a way where there's no way because like I'm going to die, but he's going to take me to be with him. There's no way. How does a dead body rise again? God, <laughs> right? So some of us, that's a word for us. If we've lost a loved one or you're facing something, this is what we mean by this. You know, and we always have to remember that, that God will make a way where there is no way. You're going to have the opportunity, the hope of resurrection, to be reunited with those we love. Amen? And this is what I mean by this is the God we believe in. He makes a way where there is no way. And even as we get older and things like that, and we begin to question that, we need to have hope in that, that God makes a way where there is no way. And so it's beginning to give me more eternal perspective about what's important now, because it's not just that that I look forward to, it's right now. And for me, it starts to be a thing like, I'm stuck. I'm right here, and it looks impossible for it, and I can't go back, but you know what? I can't stay here. I've got to live for Christ, amen? I've got to do something with my life. It's but a vapor. Truly, as you get older, have you not? Those of us, I know I'm freaking some of you out under 40, but if you're over 40, are you not going, life's but a vapor? I don't have much longer. Like, what do I want to do? If I'm not doing it, I better be doing it, Right? So God makes a way where there's no way. And when you get stuck, step forward. I mean, what are you waiting for? Death? He'll make a way for that too, but why not now? Amen? Y'all hear me? What was I talking about? All right. <laughs> Think ahead for a moment now to Jesus. Because everything points to Jesus. Think of Jesus. Jesus had to do this and everybody follow him as well. I want you to imagine the, the disciples began to scatter. Judas betrayed Jesus at the Last Supper. Jesus dies on a cross, and his disciples aren't even there. They're scattered and afraid. They're panicking because their leader dies, and they look like there's no way forward. What in the world just happened? It's three days that they're waiting around, and they're not waiting for the resurrection. It says they're going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. They thought he's gone. 
And then they're like, we can't go back. I left everything. My business is dead now. People thought I was nuts for following this crazy rabbi, and now I'm crazy. What am I going to do? He left me. He's put in a grave. The tomb is sealed. An impossible way forward. Death. But what does God do? Raises him to new life. And y'all, this is the crux of our faith, is in a risen Christ. Whenever anybody tells you it's not about that, I'm here to tell you, Paul fights this so strong in the New Testament, because we live in a culture and an age, and a new age even, that would say, oh, it wasn't that. Jesus didn't physically die. It was kind of a spiritual. Y'all, that is heresy. Jesus physically died and was raised again because you will physically die and be raised again. It is truth. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's here and available now. Amen? For us. It looked impossible, but God led the way forward. And I want to close with this because this is huge. Because some of us can't see a way forward. And we're, we can't go back. God says, get moving. He says that to us today. And when you can't see the way forward because of the situation, because of the circumstance, even because of your own self, God can see a way forward. And as you stand here today, you have the choice to do one of two things. We've already said it, to panic like the Israelites or to trust like Moses. I want to change that word trust if that's okay. Preachers like words that start with the same letter. So if I could change panic... I bet you know. Peace. 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 So you can panic? Ah. 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 Peace. I know it's hard, y'all. I know. We uh, to choose peace, to trust. I think that's what Moses was saying. Be calm, peace. You know what Jesus said constantly when he walked in rooms after he was resurrected? Don't be afraid. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace. Calm down. I told you. Here I am. We call him Doubting Thomas. He's like, where? What do you mean? He's like, here, look. I told you. That's a good told you so. Told you so. Now, I want to I close with one last thing about this, because I've been telling you that Jesus lives inside of you. Not, we have this kind of theology that says Jesus walks alongside of us. I, I grew up with that and always thought that. You ever heard that? Walk with Jesus. I'm not saying those things are, I mean, it's not bad to say that. I, I walk with Christ. Where is he? He's not. Y'all, we don't just, if we want to get it correct, we don't walk with Jesus. Jesus is at the right hand of God in heaven. Jesus said, it's better for you that I go so that I can leave my spirit not to be with you, but to be in you. So here's the thing. Christ lives in us better than with us. He lives in me. This blows my mind that the Spirit of God lives in me. Peace and panic, I was thinking about that and I I thought this this morning. The Jesus living inside me isn't the Prince of Panic. He's the Prince of what? Peace. Where'd you get that? Old Testament. He's a wonderful counselor, everlasting Father, mighty God, Prince of Panic. No, that don't make sense. Peace. He's a prince of peace. We love this scripture at Christmas. It's in Isaiah. Jesus is the prince of peace. He doesn't ever make you panic. He's not inside of you going, we better get really panicked about this one. Oh my goodness, do you see what's happening? No, what does he say? Peace, calmness, chill. I know some of you are like, this is nuts. Yes. Are you saying I can have peace in the middle of chaos? Yes. 
Are you saying I can have peace when there's a storm around me? Yes. Are you saying I can have peace if I get a diagnosis that says I'm going to die? Yes. Are you saying I can die at peace? Yes. Are you saying that I can have peace even if my marriage is a mess? Yes. It might help your marriage. Does panic ever help? No, but peace does. What would it look like? Because that's who lives in me. And he lives in you if you're a follower of Jesus. Amen. You might not be aware of it, but it's, he's there. I believe that when you say yes to Christ, there's theology. And if you have this theology, it's, that's fine, I guess. But there's this theology that says <laughs> that you believe in Jesus and then sometime later you're filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that. I believe that when you say yes to Jesus, you're immediately filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Well, I didn't know that. I know. It's taken me years to discover and be aware that I'm 100% full. It's just that I only recognize 2% of it. Anybody know? 8% of it. 50% of it. I'm finally getting to the upper ranges where I'm like, yes, this is amazing that I can still have peace. And I get tested all the time, just like you do. Wouldn't this help life? What do you do when the road forward looks impossible and the road back is impossible? You know what you do? You rely on the spirit of Christ, the Prince of Peace, who lives in you, and you step forward.